Welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Sinatra, and on behalf of the uh, Center for um, Digital Humanities at the University of Montreal and the Département de Littérature de Langue du Monde, welcome this afternoon to our guest speaker, Ray Siemens. It's my great pleasure to welcome Ray, whom I've known for nearly 20 years now. Um, Ray is a distinguished professor in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria in English with cross-appointment in computer science, and he was also appointed uh, between 2004 and 2015 as a Canada Research Chair in Humanities Computing. Ray has authored numerous articles on the intersection of literary studies and computational methods, and is the co-editor <coughs> of several book collections on Humanities Computing topics, including The Blackwell's Companion to Digital Humanities, now in its second edition, The Blackwell's Companion to Digital Literary Studies, and the MLA Literary Studies in the Digital Age volume. He's also created the Digital Humanities Summer Institute over a decade ago, and has contributed by doing so to train literally thousands of students and faculty with this major contribution to the digital and humanities com community. One of the reasons behind is being awarded the 2014 Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations Antonio Zampoli Prize for Outstanding Accomplishment. And Ray's larger research project focused on the electronic book, textual editorial intervention, online publishing, and human computer interaction. And it does so primarily through a major research collaborative project funded by Shirk called the Implementing New Knowledge Environment, or INC. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ray Simmons to Montreal. Well, thanks. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Michael. And, and thanks to the center for, for having me. And thank you all for coming for, for all sorts of reasons. Number one, it's wonderful to see you. Some of you I've known for a while. Some of you I'm just getting to know. Uh, and I really appreciate that. One of the things I most appreciate about that is that we share, I believe, a common core set of values. And people sharing values, I think, is the, the basis for wonderful things happening. Michael was kind enough to mention the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. Some of you have been there. Some of you will be there, I know, in future. And that's a collaborative effort. It began with 35 people uh, in 2001 at Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo, a very small four-year institution. And we... We met the night before, after all agreeing we were going to be there, and we decided that evening, and it may have been in a pub that we decided this, what we were going to do for the next few days. Who wanted to know more uh, about certain tools and techniques in the digital humanities, then called humanities computing? Who wanted to teach something that they had just learned, were really excited about? It? And how would that play out? That's the beginning, I think, of a lot of communal efforts. That's the beginning of of things that can get much larger. The Digital Humanities Summer Institute, I think, is indicative of that. The center here is indicative of that. The collegiality we share, the things that we do with that uh, flow, I think, positively as well. Um, title, uh, my talk is titled in a way that's probably misnamed slightly, Editing as We Imagine It to Be, a Praxis-Based Approach. Uh, there are a couple of things that I, I really want to focus in on there, and, and in particular, uh, I'd like to focus in on the concept of praxis. Uh, how do we enact, how do we take a theory, uh, a vision we share, maybe consensually, uh, how do we take something that we've come to consensus on and we know is important and then enact it? Um, again, in, in the room, uh, I know the work of some of you, uh, some of you very, very well, and I think that, that, uh, that we have some exemplary leaders uh, who, who focus on building consensus around an idea and moving it forward. In fact, Jean-Claude, I believe in you, we have probably the founder and proponent of open access as it's seen now by the Tri-Councils. Oh, that's too much? One of them. <laughs> One of them, okay. So, so when, I, when I see Praxis, I, I, I see that we as a group can take the, the ideals we share, the concepts that we hold to be true and equal, and then give them some sort of manifestation in the real world. And by real world, I also include virtual world as part of that. How we model them computationally. Um, how, we, how we take the imagination of a reading wheel and turn it into something that's a much more efficient type of machine, if you will, if that's something that we believe is an appropriate endeavor. Um, I'll move through topics quite quickly, but in essence, I think this is, this is where I'll go for roughly the next half hour or so. Talking first about a couple of contextual issues, and a few of you have heard me speak about these before. Talking about the notion of the methods commons, the notion of social knowledge creation as, uh, as um, um, meta open access and communal creation processes are being increasingly referred to. 
I'd like then to talk a little bit about a, a theoretical intervention into that, which is the concept of social scholarly editing, uh, an application of that in an edition that, uh, that my, my group did in, uh, in Victoria, uh, an exploration then of an academic circumspect kind carried out by the Modern Language Association that engages this directly, but describes it rather than imagines it as something that will come into being, acknowledges that it is in being, and imagines what happens there, and then possibly a few considerations following. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of people on the things that I'm going to be talking about, including those who are in my lab, the Electronic Textual Cultures Lab, those working primarily, but not exclusively, with the Public Knowledge Project, and it's some degree ARD, uh, those working with the Implementing New Knowledge Environments Project that Michael mentioned. And again, a few are, are in this room, and we've had a great, a great go of it for the past seven years on some of these issues. And most recently, working with the Modern Language Association to, do, in the way that, that organizations do, document, describe, support, and uh, ultimately lend credence to the sorts of issues and ideas that we share. Eventually, I'm going to zero in on this. This is an edition of the Devonshire Manuscript, and if you are like me and like to type and look and Google while you're, you're talking, while someone else is talking or you're talking, take a look over here. Uh, it's in Wikibooks, Devonshire Manuscript, um, and I'll get around to referring to this at the end, the Committee on Scholarly Editions of the Modern Language Association's white paper on the scholarly edition of the digital age. Okay, begin with the methodological commons. Are people familiar with the concept of the methodological commons? I'll talk a little bit about it then. Uh, the beauty of a, a modular presentation is you can expand or shrink as, as need be. Uh, the, the methodological commons is, is really uh, the situation of where it is we do our work in the humanities digitally and what it is in the humanities. It was best visualized here uh, in uh, 2002 by Willard McCarty and, and Harold Short as a confluence uh, in the center is where the methodological commons is um, of a variety of things that map themselves onto disciplines, map themselves into generic approaches to scholarship, ultimately map themselves in the center on types of data, numbers, music, images, alphanumeric, and uh, narrative text, and processes that come, to their, come together there as well that we enact on that data based on the disciplinary pursuits, the tools and techniques we choose to bring to that information. One way of describing the digital humanities over time is, is by using this, this as a lens. It's a wonderful diagram. It's wonderfully messy. You see arrows and thought clouds going all over. But what it suggests, I think, even in that, that visual rendition, is the way things work in our academic departments, the way in which our disciplines tend to align, realign, define, and redefine. And ultimately, when you think about digital humanities in this context, you can see it through a diagram such as this, beginning first with us doing content modeling, that is modeling in digital form the data that we use. Um, I tend to work uh, with my background, my training is in English literary studies. I tend to work with textual data, having that now manifest not only in, in print analog book form, but a digital form does me a lot of good. Once, that, once there's enough of that information modeled uh, we tend to model process, we build tools, and there are exemplary tool builders in the room. Um, we're, we're modeling the processes that we, we carry out on that digitized information. And then once we have both data and tools, once we have both content and process, we can then layer over top of it the research questions that we ask and use the tools on the data to answer our research questions. Um, this model assumes interaction, communication, dissemination of various kinds, but ultimately it tends to understand the digital humanities through traditional disciplinary approaches, through traditional types of data and traditional types of processes that are modeled computationally. Now, if you will believe me in that, and, and I hope I said nothing too objectionable, uh, nobody has shook their head or walked out, so I feel positive about that, there are some trends we can, can, we, we can I think, readily agree on as well. Particularly, continued positive movement towards being able to ask and answer research questions through increased content available to us, through increased numbers of tools or tools that are more powerful available to us, and through increased interaction, communication, and dissemination. Specifically, 
and speaking specifically to the fields that, that I know best now, uh, English literary studies, corpora keeps increasing. Before I work in Renaissance literature in particular, before we had a very small set of information available to us in digital form from the Oxford Text Archive, we had a, a, a large commercial academic partnership come in, the uh, Early English Books Online Text Creation Partnership, and magnify many fold that amount of data. And now we, we have, in fact, uh, many, many more of those sorts of initiatives going on. The, the data we have access to in my particular subdisciplinary syllabus has increased dramatically. And I, I know this is a common sort of concern. We also have increased familiarity with analytical processing. I think of the Voyant Toolkit, for example, uh, which is a tool or a set of tools that work across disciplines and different disciplinary data sets. And, and those types of tools not only increase in power, but I believe also are increasing in number. We also note increased communication amongst those who work in the community and communities that exist around specific bits of data or specific perspectives viewed on the bits of data that we work with. And, and I'm thinking of something as, as mundane as something I read by Paul Wallach in, in the, the Yale Review uh, from 1989. Uh, I believe the headline of the piece in 1989 was something like a revolution is afoot. And he's talking about email. You can now write email to someone and get an answer back no matter where they are in the world. Uh, truly astounding, but do we think it's astounding anymore? No, now we're astounded by other things. Uh, communication increases. These sorts of things all taken together lead to an acceleration of our work and our workflow. A basic type of acceleration, some people suggest, is, is what happens when you can simply ask more questions of more material more readily. An advanced type of acceleration is when you can actually ask new types of questions or have the means to understand the material in new ways. I believe these trends help facilitate both of that, doing more of what we already do, but also being able to think in new ways. Very important. And if you're with me still at this point, I'd like to suggest there are some trends that we can imagine enjoying now and into the future. One, increased data. Two, more, being able to do more of new things in some ways and more acceleration more communication with other experts and ultimately as we start going away from email one to one me to the other expert in the area that i've trained in or the group of five experts in the area I've trained in but, but me to the world by posting a tweet or doing something on uh, facebook and so on accelerated communication not only with experts in the area but those beyond the public we serve those who know much more about this sort of thing and, and know much more much better about this sort of thing suggest this that if we're behaving this way, and if the trends in our academic work are going this way, we may well have a better chance of asking more pertinent research questions, the things that drive our endeavor, with better means of ultimately answering those research questions and better ability to reflect the answers we do come up with in expert community and larger societal discourse. Look a bit further ahead, if you're still with me, maybe you'll agree also that these long-term tendencies building on these trends suggest even more data yet, new tools creation and adoption, and ultimately communication strategies if we're willing to follow the recent trend in social computing that has brought academics and the general public closer together, ultimately some increased type of public interaction, bringing together academic data creation and analysis and then academic discourse via electronic means, but putting them in closer proximity to the public, where the public is not only, let's say, a receptor of what it is we produce as scholars. Open access enables that wonderfully well, but ultimately becomes a new type of partner. That relationship becomes redefined. This has the potential to change what we do quite radically. We might want to be prepared for this or other things similar. The sorts of questions we might want to ask as scholars of our generation or new generations could change quite radically reflecting this convergence of direct public engagement, not only dissemination, but engagement, outreach, inreach, and upreach. The precise direction, I think, is, is hard to determine, but you can see the trends and the movement in that direction. I'd like to suggest that as one of several contexts for my talk. It leads reasonably well into the second uh, of the two contextual things I'd like to talk about, and that's this overarching concept of social knowledge creation. Um, think Wikipedia, think things better than Wikipedia. Uh, and as we imagine contextually engaging this, I think there are a few things that, that are worth pointing out. 
Number one, knowledge production has always been messy. People look at Wikipedia and they think about how people engage with each other, how they engage with knowledge, and they go, but I'm an expert. And there's someone down the road who doesn't, didn't do the 10 years training I did and isn't uh, responsible for, for maintaining the traditions that I'm responsible for maintaining. What if I write something and they write something and they disagree? That's pretty messy. Well, knowledge has always been messy. Knowledge production certainly has been. And, and one of the things that I think the, the, the movement towards open sort of online messy knowledge forum in the past generation, one of the things that's become very evident is just as we look back into the past, how similar the sorts of things we're doing now that we call messy are like those things that were done in the past that ultimately over generations and generations and several centuries came together and formalized into the production systems we now know the production systems that are driven in the ways we now understand. Ultimately, knowledge was and is inevitable, plural, affected by multiple institutions, political and economic conditions, cultural specificities, and agencies. Knowledge isn't the book on the shelf. Knowledge is the messy process that leads to, well, maybe a book on a shelf, but also maybe a blog post, and maybe up-to-date information in Wikipedia that's uh, that's industry standard or whatever phrasing you might want to use to talk about something that's uh, achieved an appropriate spot and, and reflection of, of our human understanding of something. This understanding, I think, really does reflect human social patterns of interaction and exchange over time. Uh, you only have to look at people like Foucault, Sheridan, Baudou, and others to understand how both we are shaped by technology, but, uh, but we shape it, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. Some of the most interesting case studies in this thing uh, for, for, for purpose here are those that come out of the study of 1960s counterculture and power dialogues around knowledge. The, the same sorts of uh, disagreements in this particular case study that ultimately became the culture out of which Silicon Valley emerged and, and the thinking behind uh, uh, the, the personal computer, the thinking behind a lot of the systems that are now a reality for us. Humanists have always engaged this sort of thing too. One thing uh, I often hear in disciplinary context is that humanists aren't necessarily interested in some of the topics that I've just mentioned. But no, humanists have always engaged this sort of thing, embracing at times, studying and observing at times. And inevitably, we're good humanists, I think we problematize. We necessarily and unnecessarily problematize as a way of understanding the nature of what it is we're engaging. And then we encounter something like the read-write internet, or Web 2.0. Is everyone familiar with the concept of Web 2.0? Uh, a lot of nodding. Uh, in essence, it's, it's an internet where you're not only a passive receiver of information, uh, you're not only a reader of a book, but you participate actively in the processes involved in creating the content that you can then receive as well. When that's brought into a humanities context, uh, some call that humanities 2.0, read-write humanities. Humanities, which is very active and engaged, not only as an open disseminator, but as an open receiver from those who consider themselves part of the audience and community the humanities serve. I'll skip over a couple of slides here, but, but uh, nowhere did this become more apparent uh, than a few years ago in the New York Times, which ran a series of columns called Humanities 2.0. Um, uh, and, uh, and there, if you squint your eyes, you might be able to see articles on, on GIS, uh, on digital humanities, and uh, and uh, training uh, and collegial networks, uh, uh, social scholarly networks and crowdsourcing, um, data mining, uh, working with billions of words and so on. This is Humanities 2.0. In Humanities 2.0, those again much more qualified to make these types of assertions than I am, I note that the central role of the academic goes from that of being a uh, custodian of knowledge and an authority on knowledge and more of a facilitator of knowledge creation and interaction. Still custodial in part, still authoritative in some ways, but ultimately facilitating the engagement of a community with knowledge, the engagement of a community beyond experts with knowledge and the creation of that knowledge by a community that can readily include more than those who are the, trained to be expert and to be custodians. This is really also the sort of thing humanists have engaged in over time quite readily. I go back in my own tradition and I look at the, the very early humanists 
uh, of the, the early English Renaissance, uh, themselves looking to the Netherlands, looking to France, looking to, to, to other countries which had active knowledge production units form, shaping the rise of the printing press, the rise of the agencies that then governed what could be printed and how information circulated, the pamphlet wars. Humanists have always been very actively involved here and I think are very actively, increasingly actively involved in what's going on with knowledge creation today. The principle, uh, the motivating factor for, for most of those in the humanities tends to be the notion that the humanities themselves and the subjects that make up the humanities can be reintegrated with the public sphere in a way that one might have felt they were uh, in the distant past, if you follow the, the argument at Fontes, and the, the, the wonderful time at the source where everything was pure and clean. But they argue that by working in a humanities 2.0 mode, by being able to interact with those who share the values of the humanities, uh, expert and non-expert alike, we can reinvigorate and continue these trends that have put the humanities for so long at the center of knowledge, the center of technology related to knowledge and the center of understanding. Alan Liu talks about these and Calder and Ross. Um, people like um, <clears throat> Anne Balsamo and many, many others talk also about this type of public engagement being the key to the humanities future because it removes what is increasingly in, in university quarters a reliance on corporate funding, external funding, business funding, to drive objectives, to drive what's important. By reconnecting with the society that humanists serve in a very direct way, the argument is that this adds freedom. This adds the ability to do more of what those who are in the positions that we're in feel that we should be doing. And ultimately, those who I think are, are, are very interested in moving forward quickly talk about this version of Humanities 2.0 involving redesigning knowledge creation practices for <coughs> social investment, social involvement, and extending the production outside of the structures we use today, outside of those that are institutional, but outside of those that are also just disciplinary, disciplinarily constraining. This is where I think digital humanism comes in very closely and clearly. Uh, some say that DH has evolved over time into a meta-discipline that that redesigns methods, uh, communication structures for the humanities with a focus in particular on openness and sharing. The sorts of best efforts that we've seen from the digital humanities community here have been, been grassroots and inclusive, and they tend to prioritize an engagement with citizen scholars. Uh, but they also tend to pr prioritize an engagement within the academy that tends to dissolve hierarchies that exist from certain types of professorial rank to to those who are in, in other ranks at the student level or, or those who are in postdoctoral positions. All of this comes together, I think, very well. And all of this ultimately, I believe, is reorienting in nature. The next step, many argue, is a shift away from traditional textual types of dissemination that we often find, someone writes an article, someone writes a book, and so on, and moves towards things that are inherently argumentative and experimental, and, and it's prototyping Steve Ramsey and Jeffrey Rockwell names that come to mind here, modeling, uh, Ella Willard McCarty, prototyping like Stan Rucker and Alan Gailey have argued, and critical making like Gentry Sayers and Matt Ratto and others have argued. This list could be very, very, very long, include several in the room. It could also include many, many of those who are doing well-known work outside the room. There's just so much going on that we're already doing. The next step is something we're already engaged in very actively now. But by doing this, what we're really doing is redefining our role with the society around us. We're really bringing humanism front and center to the community that humanism has always typically, traditionally, and I think very well served. Praxis here is the key. Having a theory about how something should be is not enough. Having a theory that then leads further into enactment, further into practice, is ultimately the way in which we engage and we impact the society that we serve. Our intervention in this particular vein was in the social scholarly edition. We did a, a very, very quick topology a number of years ago about what electronic scholarly editing looked like to date. And there I'm, I'm talking really about the preparations of editions for use in research and teaching. Uh, we noticed, for example, that in the late 1980s, uh, we had uh, this thing, typologically speaking, called the dynamic text, which was an electronic text that came with some analytical tools, and the two of them were put together. Uh, 
I think of something like TACT, text analysis computing tools, where you could either download it. I believe it was the first open source digital humanities tool available. You could download it, download some texts, run them on your DOS command line, and, uh, and you would have a text that indexed and concorded itself, one that allowed you to analytically engage with the digitized content. A beautiful thing for its time, and one that led very quickly once, uh, once we saw the rise of hypertext in the 1990s to something which is best characterized as the hypertextual edition. Um, Jerome McGann and many others uh, are associated with this type of thinking and have often called it the technical manifestation of social theories of entity. And what the hypertextual edition was, was largely uh, organized facilitation with the various parts of a scholarly edition, its apparatus, its commentary, and beyond, but all interlinked by a hypertextual means. Go a decade further yet, and, and what you'll find in the theoretical writing, the sorts of tools that people are trying to build, the edition people are, try, people are trying to build, is the, the notion known, or the, the type of edition known as the dynamic edition, which unites the features of the dynamic text, algorithmic facilitation of interaction with core text or group of texts, with hypertextual organization of materials, editors drawing links between one thing and the next, at the same time as also bringing in a corpus of materials beyond the reading material of the edition that ultimately could reflect the entire amount of, uh, of knowledge around a single, excuse me, a single text or a single author. We tried to build one of these, my lab did, uh, with the support of the Canada Research Chairs Program and the Canadian Foundation for Innovation beginning in 2004. Um, and we produced interfaces that look like this for our Renaissance English knowledge base or record and professional reading environment pre-projects. Um, it was a lot of fun. We took a look at manuscripts, we took a look at secondary sources, we took a look at primary sources. We started working with, with reading tools over time. We started at a time when those we were working with in our consultative groups and our advisory groups had yet to understand something which had not yet been developed, which is social computing, Web 2.0. We began in 2004, and I mentioned that date deliberately, not only because it's truthfully when we began, but if you can remember back to 2004, how many people had Twitter? How many people had Facebook? How many people had anything that operated like those things? How about 2008? Who was on Twitter then? Stefan, I think you told me I should be on Twitter in 2008. Maybe? About then? How many people had Facebook? Just emerging, maybe? You can keep in touch with your family members, and <laughs> friends, and so on. Well, what we found was when we were developing these interfaces and this particular dynamic edition approach, that the advisory groups that we've been talking with at the time completely changed what they felt they wanted in an academic tool that would allow them to interact. Most of them are textually based scholars working in humanistic disciplines that read books that would allow them to interact with the book. They not only wanted to be able to analyze the book and see that uh, manifest in electronic fashion, they not only wanted that, they also wanted reasonable to be able to see the book in context, have an editor maybe suggest how this thing's related to the next thing and the next thing hypertextually. They wanted to understand how that could exist within a framework that, that, that would have secondary sources and articles and books written about that main central concern. They wanted to talk with each other about it. They wanted to engage with a community that was interested in that same book they were reading electronically, that same edition. And we noted then the rise of a social, uh, of an academic concern with, with social computing. Um, this completely changed what we were thinking about doing at the time, and so we abandoned ship in the best way possible, and we chalked this up to documenting a failure, not necessarily of our own work, but a failure of our ability to anticipate something that nobody could have seen coming in the way that it did. So we, we wrote an article, uh, a very long article, 50 pages with uh, 461 pages of appendices and another gig or so of uh, ancillary files called Underpinnings of the Social Edition. It was a narrative of our project up to 2009, uh, published it with, uh, in a collection edited by Jerome McGann, Andy Stouffer, Dana Wheels, and Michael Picard called Online Humanity Scholarship, The Shape of Things to Come, as we reflected on the shape of what once was. And immediately embarked from there into what we felt was a way of trying to understand those social impulses that we were hearing 
from our academic colleagues, experts in the field, experts in understanding what they should expect of their textual edition, that text that they're reading in relation to all others. Um, and we began at that point our theoretical intervention. We documented this in a couple ways. Uh, Megan Timney was lead on our first attempt at this, uh, an open paper that was distributed freely and used in a, a, few, um, <clears throat> a few seminars and so on, called Opening the Gates, a new model for edition production in a time of collaboration. And it was a wonderful piece and deliberately provocative, although we, we, had, no, we had no idea just how negatively some people would react to the phrase opening the gates. It sounded like the barbarians were coming in. So when we reworked it and, and, and so on, we also retitled it toward modeling the social edition, an approach to understanding electronic scholarly editions, the context of new and emerging social media. And at that point, we published not only the, the theoretical piece, if you will, but we published at the same time, uh, this piece was in literary and linguistic computing, but we published an annotated bibliography of, of all the sources that, that we could find available to this movement to inform this movement in Digital Humanities Quarterly, uh, available on my webpage if you're interested, but also by many other ways. What we were arguing for there was, in essence, an understanding of the electronic scholarly edition, which I've just shared with you, um, a documentation of the motivation to extend electronic textual traditions, editorial traditions, into this social computing age talking about the humanist generally and the activities of those in the humanities, specifically those types of activities which would draw us as a community together. Not sole scholar work, but communities of people working together. Um, a survey of the software that was available at that point, and then a toolkit towards being able to create one's own editions of this sort. Um, I'm going to jump through a few things here. The, the, the key to everything we stated in that particular intervention, though, was that we, we argued that this thing called the social edition, which builds on the other types of editions that we were talking about then, other than about the destination, but it was really was a process-oriented, <clears throat> a process-oriented edition that shared values that were read-write with the community that might be most interested in this type of material, shared Web 2.0 or Humanities 2.0 values, user-driven, perpetually in beta, and always networked. And publishing is not necessarily the end of the writing process where you give it to someone and they publish it. Publishing is making it public so that people can be getting work on it. Um, we felt really positive about, about this. Um, and then we tried to enact it. And here's the application. Here's the praxis, if you will, of, uh, of our theoretical intervention. And that's this edition, edition of this, the Devonshire Manuscript. Um, it exists in the British Library's additional manuscript, 17492. Um, I'll talk a bit about the manuscript. It might give you a sense of why, why we chose it in particular. But uh, at any rate, it's, it's a manuscript from the 1530s uh, from the English court. It's a poetic miscellany, a whole bunch of different things all tossed together, mostly poetry and marginalia. Uh, existed in the court, so we also call it a courtly anthology. Um, it originated in and around Queen Anne Boleyn's court. And I don't expect everyone to know English history, but uh, Anne Boleyn might ring a bell. She had issues with her husband, Henry VIII, and it didn't end well. It really didn't end well. Um, we, find, we find that document the ways in which it's documented. It's got about 4,500 lines of poetry across 114 leaves. It's a paper manuscript. It's about the size of a small paperback book, trade paperback maybe has about 185 items of verse, which include fragments, but also complete poems, extracts, rewritten poems, poems that are shaped or translated from English into English, let's say, for specific purposes. Um, and a lot of marginal notation, a lot of back and forth, where someone has read the poem and they say something about it, and then someone else reads the poem and argues with them in, in the margins. Its prominence is that it's the first sustained example of men and women writing together in a community in a sustained way in the English tradition, uh, mimicking what was already going on in, in the court in France, in the court in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, it's said to be used at the trial of Anne Boleyn for infidelity and ultimately her execution. And if you watch the Tudors miniseries, you will find reference to some of the material. Did anyone watch the Tudors miniseries? It was, it was a little bit trashy. Um, uh, it, you'll, you'll find reference to some of these sorts of materials. It had social cachet. And a very natural choice for us to do something that was 
intended to have a connection with the public was to work on material that the public, at least those who watch the Tudors miniseries, were engaged in. Um, it's also been called in the last few years, I think in the Times Literary Supplement, when a book that touched on this was reviewed, um, the Devonshire manuscript existing in its natural form and all its glory like that, early modern Facebook, basically where people posted their stuff, they commented on their stuff, they interacted. And the way this manuscript circulated, I think, helps underline that, in that it was a manuscript that began uh, as a wedding gift to a couple, um, but they circulated around all their friends who added material. You've got evidence of at least six, five or six hands here, different writing, uh, writing materials used. You've got some marginalia. You've got uh, a poem that's actually a work in progress. You can even see some evidence of bits being rubbed out and written over. Uh, early modern Facebook. You convinced her? Kind of. It's a, it's a thing to behold. Uh, and, and because of its cachet, even early on, it was a, a piece that had a, its mention in excuse me, uh, in Wikipedia. And our goal was to add to wiki-based knowledge of this by producing a full scholarly edition of it with an entire team based in my lab and well beyond my lab, working with an uh, expert group from the Renaissance English Tech Society and scholars uh, university, uh, in the University of London system at Oxford and Cambridge. And ultimately we produced a traditional scholarly edition, which included uh, not always traditional, but a facsimile of the original. We negotiated with Adam Matthew Press for uh, the ability to use uh, downgraded um, images uh, of the text. Uh, we uh, did an appropriate transcription, not for a modern audience, because one of our colleagues uh, was doing that already, but we, we did a, an accurate, faithful transcription of the characters on the page, which are very difficult to read uh, for the most part. Uh, we then published a full commentary and the full textual collation with works cited in academic fashion. And we made it available to the same group that was not only, say, like those of us in the room who saw themselves as experts in the area and custodians of the tradition and the material, but we made it open through Wikibooks to everyone. In fact, that there is a way where you can keep some stuff working for a while, or at least there used to be, we haven't done this for a while, and then make it public. We made it public right from the start. And what did we notice? People came in and read it. Which, and, and they were beyond uh, those who we could identify coming from academic institutions. They were beyond our coterie, if you will, that was producing it. They were people who sometimes added valuable material and sometimes didn't. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a sec. But as we were planning to, to make this edition public, and we've got about four or five more minutes. Is that okay? Perfect. Excellent. Um, we, uh, we found ourselves engaging a, a whole set of issues with our colleagues who were wonderful, with uh, those citizen scholars who identified with our work who were wonderful, and those in the general public who came in and read and sometimes told us what they thought. They were wonderful too. When we first presented the, the idea of doing this work uh, to, to a group at University of London at the Institute for English Studies and Senate House, um, the presentation didn't go so well. The question and answer period afterwards didn't go so well either in that uh, I heard a lot of the sorts of things we, we hear about when we talk about changing our role as uh, those of the, uh, as one that, that emanates academic authority and moves more towards controlled academic facilitation of authority. Um, mine was the last paper before the wine break, which was very nice. And so what I did after a very vigorous question and answer period is that each person who had put up their hand I made a quick note on a piece of paper. I, I went, once we all had a glass of wine, and I invited them to join our project on the editorial board. Each person said yes, and my argument was this. Someone else is going to do this if we don't do it. And isn't our role one of ensuring that this material continues to be engaged in appropriate ways? Aren't we leaders in this? Shouldn't we be the ones interacting? And 201, everyone accepted that as a rational argument after a bit of wine, and then uh, and then joined our board. And you can see the, the board members uh, if you go and take a look at the page. Um, the Tudors miniseries came out about this, side, this time too. I, I also mentioned it, but what that meant is that our, our site had massive influx of, of viewers, of, of users, of readers that we couldn't possibly have expected otherwise. Um, and perhaps more than one would expect on an academic subject or an academic manuscript from the 16th century that you can't read unless someone has transcribed it and ultimately modernized it. <coughs> you probably wouldn't have that unless you had someone running a mini-series that made reference to the material 
or to some of the same characters who are authors of the manuscript and so on. That was really interesting. Our response was to do the best that we could to, to rise to the occasion. Um, part of this was working with Wikibooks. Has anyone worked with Wikipedia or Wikibooks? We had an editor assigned to us, uh, someone who was in a time zone about 10 hours well, f further east of us. And so if anything happened overnight, uh, he, it was a him in this case, he would have caught it. And in fact, he did, because we had a vandalism <coughs> attempt that was particularly uh, nasty, which had been taken care of uh, before we even got up. It happened, uh, it happened at 2 a.m. our time. It was taken care of by 4 a.m. Someone was reading, and someone in our community who was reading, working with the editor himself too, had noticed that there was some vandalism. We were watched page by, by a group of people, and they fixed it. A testament, I think, to the way that the system is supposed to work, and the same way, so the ways we're supposed to work all together. More important than that, though, is the valuable contributions we had by people in the community who were engaged, maybe not expert in early Tudor non-dramatic poetry, and there are only about a dozen of us in the world, uh, maybe two dozen, who are really expert in, in that particular sub-sub-sub-discipline, and then in particular this manuscript, too. Um, but but those, <laughs> those who have that expertise, you know, really love the material. I'm among them. But we had surprising, surprising contributions by people who had other areas of expertise to share in the context of what we were trying to do. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, is we, were, we were looking for a reference in a poem of Wyatt written, uh, the, the way the story goes in, in contemporary uh, telling is that, that Wyatt wa had a relationship with Anne Boleyn before she married King Henry VIII. Now, someone may know this better than me, so correct me if you do. Uh, Anne got married to Henry VIII, but the relationship continued. And this was one of the issues associated with Boleyn at her trial for infidelity. Uh, she was sentenced to death. Uh, Thomas Wyatt was asked to go and translate the penitential songs. Different. Anyways, we, we don't have to talk too much about that, but this is justice in that day and age. Um, there's a reference to a place called Goodwin Sands in a poem that Thomas Wyatt writes about Anne Boleyn. And it's so explicit, we thought it had to mean something, and so we did what was available to us as literary scholars for the most part. We went through all the sources we would look at typically, uh, we saw where it was on the map, at least as much as we could see on the map, because it's com it comes and goes, it's hidden, this is the issue. Not only with the tide is it hidden, but it, it tends to form some years more than others. It's a place in the water where ships would run aground. Uh, the line is, uh, I would she were, or I would they were on Goodwin Sands, meaning I wish they hit some surprising catastrophe. Where is Goodwin Sands located? Well, we didn't know this, but someone else did. It's located right next to the Anne's home of Anne Boleyn. Oh, Anne Boleyn. To bring the, the, the poem together for, for many of our readers, and certainly for us as editors, caring about the meaning of the poem. This came to us from someone who had nautical knowledge, historical nautical knowledge. They were participating in another project, if I'm remembering this correctly, about mapping early uh, weather reports uh, coming from the, the mariner, mariner tradition. We also had a number of really valuable discussions in the blogosphere and Twitter. Um, uh, we, we were uh, talked about the type of manuscript and edition it was, was talked about in various kinds of blogs and talked about not in a passive way. There was a lot of engaged back and forth, asking questions about how this type of edition works, asking questions about how to contribute, asking questions about how to ensure appropriate quality over time. Those are questions that, that we answered as best we could, not only in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in, in blog-like forums, but we also uh, answered a fair bit in Twitter. The, the Twitter response came because we were tweeting one line of the manuscript per day, some days two lines, just for fun. And we had people who were not only um, saying, hey, this is great, the best Twitter ever, someone said, um, but then they would write their own renaissance verse back to us. And we knew we'd hit on a community that was interested in these sorts of things maybe a little too interested at times. Um, ultimately, people wanting to know about some of the issues we encountered in terms of intellectual property, the production process, and so on. Uh, here we have Chris Shirley, who's handled as Lord Burley. And in addition to being in the social sphere, which we were hoping to engage with this edition, we also found ourselves pushing back into standard professional outlets. Um, this is a piece, uh, opening peer review from several years ago, that, that featured the nature of the work we were doing here and how, how the public was, at least for our particular work, seen to be uh, a, a valuable part not only of the, the creation process, but also the process of, uh, of qualitative assurance. And lastly, 
from a massive online site to one we had print in Wikibooks. You can print a Wikibook if you want. We had print uh, and we got two volumes, 1400 pages in total back, a lot of material, ultimately back into traditional academic forms where we produced a, a standard uh, print volume uh, for, for those in the field with the series New Technology and Medieval Renaissance Studies and Medieval and Renaissance Texts and Studies, so boutique text uh, series in the area. Uh, producing materials largely for uh, for um, a scholarly network. My comments continue only very slightly, and that is into uh, the first stage, I think, of the aftermath of this sort of work and the first acknowledgement uh, in our expert societies of the value of, of this sort of work. And this comes out of the Modern Language Association's Committee on Scholarly Editions white paper on the scholarly edition in the digital age. Uh, here, for two years, uh, those who were on the committee of scholarly editions got together to look at issues, not only about the scholarly edition itself, but also how the scholarly edition fits within a structure like the Modern Language Association, which, which encourages and supports scholars to work uh, across the board uh, in, in the ways that the disciplines it supports uh, suggest, but also it awards a seal for accurate, best produced scholarly editions. So the Committee on Scholarly Editions awards a seal, and they were thinking how their thinking should change for the award of that type of seal. And, and this particular piece does a number of things which I think are, are valuable in this context. It talks first about the scholarly, it talks first about central terms, like what is an edition? What is a scholarly edition? And what is a digital edition? And what are all of those things together? Particularly about the digital, it talks about the sorts of things that anyone producing and engaging digital editions need to be aware of. It talks about how, first of all, for, for those who aren't familiar with digital editions, how, how working in the digital world offers additional ways of designing and building scholarly editions and additional contexts for the use of those editions, ways of understanding them in cultural contexts. For example, the Tudor miniseries found the Devonshire manuscript a document that served their cultural context and their understanding based on a made-for-TV uh, series. Not quite the academic route to get at the material, but a valuable one nonetheless. The digital, we also asserted, offers methods that need, needing to be carefully thought through, motivated and explained, and features need to be consistent with the goal of the edition. What's most interesting to me are not those things, which I think were very valuable and good to define for, for those who share our interests, but specifically benefits and key modalities. The benefits and key modalities uh, the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editions articulated, number one was reuse. Data prepared for one thing, if prepared properly, can be used for many, many other things that we can't possibly anticipate and those we can readily anticipate. Two, writability allows valuable user contributions from those who are expert in the community, but those also beyond. And correction and emendation. Nobody likes to believe they make mistakes, but I think anyone who's looked at their own page proofs will, will see that uh, mistakes can be made, and sometimes they're not even caught at the proofing stage. Um, ultimately, though, the culmination of this in, uh, in social engagement. The users themselves are empowered, if the system is designed properly, to occupy the role of a contingent editor, maybe looking at things differently, maybe editing and presenting materials in different contexts that are equally valuable perhaps not valuable in a scholarly context, but equally valuable in context that those in society at large might have for those materials. A number of considerations are made, but in particular, the chief consideration that's made and urged is that digital edition should attend to possibilities of sampling, reuse, and remix, so that the sorts of things that we were doing with the Devonshire manuscript could actually happen, the sorts of things that we were theorizing about the social scholarly edition that happen so that the tools and techniques that no one could have anticipated coming as quickly as they did. No one could have anticipated in 2004, by the time we got to 2008, that we would already be thinking so socially in terms of our computing, that addition should be able to respond to similar changes in the future. I could go into further considerations, but uh, I think I'll stop there. I've talked a lot right after lunch. I apologize for talking so long. Uh, I feel pretty strongly about what I'm talking about, and that just means I ramble. So uh, I want to thank you for listening to my ramble, 
uh, I want to thank you very much for your interest in, in these sorts of these sorts of areas as well. We got time for questions. I'm just going to turn off the. Uh...